suburban boy transplanted to the wilderness. Setting up to mill this log. What kind of bills do you have? <laughs> Didn't cost a dime. We found water. So this is the addition that I'm building on. This is our central greenhouse. So what we got here is your standard 45 gallon drum. Raw copper here. I'm going to show you how these guys have lived off-grid in the Canadian wilderness for up to 32 years. Up in the farthest northerly reaches of British Columbia, just below the Yukon border, is a family that has been living off-grid in the Canadian bush for decades. Traveling from urban Ontario, Stephen Badwar had romanticized ideals of living carefree in the wilds. Eventually, after moving onto a piece of property with only a few dilapidated structures succumbing to the elements, the reality set in. No running water, no electricity, no central heating, no refrigerator, no nearby stores, not much of anything, really. Just an empty shack falling into disrepair with an outhouse, an old sauna with a sod roof, and a crumbling chicken coop. But he adapted. How did he do this, and manage to get married and begin raising a son in the process? This is a story of tenacity, ingenuity, and survival. This is David, and this is Stephen. And they're going to tell you some of the things they've done out here living in the Canadian bush for quite some time. This is the original cabin, 14 feet by 17, made by a group of back to the landers who were here in the 1980s. They lived here for about six or seven years. And they built this and then we built the addition off the end there. Tell us about what you've built here over the years. Well, my good friend Dave and I have built quite a number of things. Uh, we've built a 72 foot greenhouse. 50 foot greenhouse, a 40 foot workshop, a whole bunch of little smaller buildings and uh, we've renovated the sauna, the one with the sod roof and put a new roof on that. And then this cabin behind us, these logs here are all standing dead spruce and then we milled them with uh, Alaska chainsaw mill. Uh, one by one so they've got a flat edge on three sides or a cant on three sides so they're stacked up here kind of like Lego with a plywood spline in between so the wind can't flow through and then we put uh, chinking made out of uh, sand and sawdust and sphagnum moss and alkali. Yeah, we have an old cabin over there and then the addition is twice the size of the old cabin, the gravel floor. This one's got a plywood floor. You lived in this for seven years? Yeah, this one for seven years, that one over there for about 25. One room cabin, 25 years. This one here is 30 by 18 approximately. So. Double the size of the old one. And how long did it take you guys to build these? <laughs> About three years. <laughs> we worked on it slowly, bit by bit, because I had a day job, so come home and I worked at night. David worked most days on, alone for most of three years. So it took us a while, but we eventually got it. And it's all local, like as I said. Didn't cost a dime, apart from the gas, to pull all these logs in by skidoo. And then the milling, of course, lots of gas and oil for the chainsaw mill. And then a few nails and screws to put her up. So what about the windows? Well, these are all recycled. A friend took them out of another old building and gave them to us and trade for something. I don't know what. Uh, but windows you can often find. Misfit windows, broken windows, or one where there's a pane missing or something like that. So it's possible to find windows for, for cheap. Well, that's good. So finding windows is not necessarily a pain. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little cluttered, but it's cozy. You were a vegetarian when you first got here? I was a vegetarian for seven years, and when I first arrived here in the north, um, I was hungry. I lived in a teepee for my first uh, three years. So, my first winter, lots of snow, cold, working outside, cutting firewood with a bow saw. Didn't have anything, didn't even have a truck that winter. So we were hungry, and uh, one day, Native man comes to my teepee. Here, eat this. Big, fat, juicy moose roast. We jumped in like you wouldn't believe and ate the whole thing. And I've been hunting and fishing and eating wild meat ever since. So I hunt black bear, mountain goat, and moose. My principal species. And then grouse and rabbit and squirrel. And you were surviving mainly on rice and beans? Rice and beans. And tootin' like a like a cowboy, because <laughs> we couldn't eat enough rice and beans to keep warm. 
Like you need to eat a lot, like double to triple what you would eat if you were a vegetarian in the city, double to triple the amount of rice and beans. So much so, I was working at a sawmill and uh, my boss said, Stephen, I don't want you eating rice and beans anymore when you're on the job site because it's just too much flash rice. Because I ate so much rice and beans. So that's one of the reasons why I started eating moose meat. <laughs> and a native woman, a native elder told me, Stephen, you need black bear meat. And I didn't like the idea of killing a black bear because to me they were a pristine animal that you respect. But if you kill it respectfully and eat it respectfully with prayer and thought and intention, that's okay for me. So I'm, that's my primary species. I kill about two black bears every three years. So not every year, but every second year or every year, get a black bear. And that's my principal species because there's lots of them and hardly anybody hunts black bear anymore. And the meat is fat and the fat is marbled throughout the meat. So the native elder who took me under her wing the first few years I was here, she told me, Stephen, if you're going to live in a teepee, you need black bear meat. That's working man's meat. That's bushman's meat. And so it's still my principal species. And most people from Europe, when I say I eat black bear, they go, you can eat black bears? Like, yes, it's a carnivore. It's an omnivore, to be accurate, as we are. We are omnivores. So a lot of people hesitate when it comes to eating um, uh, carnivores, but you can eat a carnivore. It's not biblical, it's not scriptural, but biologically we can consume it and we can eat it and it can give us sustenance. So I eat black bear. That's the only carnivore I eat or, or omnivore I eat. It's thick and it's rich and it and it's fatty and when you eat it you don't need as much as you as moose meat or caribou or anything else because it's so rich and it gives you it gives you energy but moreover it gives you fat which keeps you warm in the winter so if you're living outside and working outside when you eat that meat you're warmer and you're more active and you're more healthy how does the taste compare to say caribou or moose deeper and richer so not gamey, closer to, I don't eat pork anymore for reasons of my own, uh, but I would, I would say closer to pork in the respect that pork is also an omnivore. Pig is an omnivore. They can eat anything, including a human. They will do that um, if a farmer dies in a paddock, for example. Um, so similar to pork in that it's dense and, and fatty and that the fat is marbled throughout the meat. Same grain structure as well. And a bear has a simple digestive system similar to a pig as well. So that's in flavor and texture and in fat content similar to a pig. It has depth of flavor. Depth of flavor. You can really taste the depth in there. It's not sharp like caribou or sharp like goat or not flat like moose meat. I consider moose meat to be poor man's meat. Like I keep kill one moose maybe every 10 years because it's not my favorite meat. It gives you a lot of sustenance because you get you know 800 pounds or 500, 600 pounds of meat depending on the size of the moose. But to me, moose meat is bland and dry. Black bear is my favorite. So tell us what's going on here, Dave. Okay, I'm setting up to mill this log and get some rafters out of it using Alaska style mill which will sit across these two with the chainsaw going underneath and setting it to cut the lines as I've marked on the end of the log and right now we're needing to get it balanced and straight and too high this. Okay. And so then that's right on right there. You want me to screw her in? Yeah. Here's how it fits in to that apparatus. So it fits on just like this yeah. and it saws on down the line. Yeah. Tell me about the facilities. Okay, well, that's where we're going right now. This is the trail to the outhouse, or the water closet, as it's called in the United Kingdom. Or the loo. Or the loo, or the biffy, or the john, 
or the Dunning down yeah. under. Yeah, it goes on and on. So this is a regular backwoods Canadian outhouse made out of old salvage lumber and slab wood. Uh, we built it in the bush. You can see we got into glacial till or gravel. So it was easy digging, loose rock. Um, built, built it maybe three feet down, a hole about two and a half feet by two and a half feet. And then you, uh, I keep these things on and that way you can, every three or four years, you can just lift your whole outhouse up and move it. You just need four people. And then on the inside, the operative thing is two inches of styrofoam SM. You can't live in the bush without it. Um, I don't know what people did before we had styrofoam SM, but uh, my, my blessings on Dow Corning or whoever it is who makes it because it's warm. As soon as you touch it, minus 40 Fahrenheit or Celsius, you touch that five seconds later, it feels warm. So without that, it would be an ordeal going to the outhouse in the middle of the winter. Other important thing, you need to keep this vital stuff, TP, toilet paper, inside old tobacco can, coffee tin so the squirrels and mice don't get it because they will chew it up. They'll find it in 48 hours and it's gone. So always got to be in there. Also keeps the rain out too, or moisture. Now you were telling me when you first moved here, you are eating like three to four pounds of rice and beans yes. every day. Yes. So, <laughs> and that's to stay warm because calories yep. equal energy. Correct. Energy equals body heat. Body. However, whatever goes in must come out. So you must have unleashed yes. some rather Voluminous. sizable loads. <laughs> yes, it is true. Um, yeah, if you're living in the bush and eating volumes of rice and beans, yeah, be prepared that uh, you might have to make frequent trips or large trips to, to the biffy in the backwoods. <laughs> so where are we heading? We're off to get water. All right. When you need to get water, you got to go find it. We found water. Look at that. <laughs> Didn't have to look too hard. to have two sources of water. The lake, which is crystal clear and clean, and this one, which is an underground stream which comes from the mountains. A stream that's up in the surface, a couple kilometers, a couple miles up the hill, it goes into the uh, substrata and becomes an underground stream. This site here is actually a sacred site to the native people of this land. So, I'm going to Give a little tobacco offering to give thanks to Creator, to God, for all the blessings that we have. The water, the air, the soil, and the fire. Right now, we have to thank Creator for water. All the clean, pure drinking water that gives us life, gives the animals and the plants life, keeps us hydrated, and keeps us healthy and happy. Thank you, God. How does the taste differ from the lake? It tastes a little more like, a little more earthy, has more depth of flavor. The lake is neutral, glacier fried. It's almost like distilled water. It's very bland, but neutral. So good for coffee and tea. This one here, a lot of people like this stream here. They come from miles and miles away to drink this water. One, because it has a depth of flavor and a good earthy taste, but also because the native people believe, some of the elders believe, that this water has healing properties. And one elder actually says that it actually curbs your appetite for alcohol. 
also for those people that struggle with alcohol, this is a good place to come. So, Stephen, what kind of bills do you have? <laughs> well, gas is probably the biggest one. Gas is, we always say gas is our rent because when you live in the bush, you live a long way from town. So, for example, yesterday we went to Whitehorse, Yukon to get building supplies and groceries. So, that's like 175 miles or something like that. So, that's just to get groceries and to go out for dinner. Anyway, so bills, gas, and then building supplies. So plywood, I can't make plywood. I can make two by fours, but I can't make plywood. So these things here were what, 40 bucks a sheet. So I spent $2,000 yesterday in building supplies. So, does that answer your question? Well, what about, <laughs> what about internet? Do you pay for internet? Of course we do. Yeah, okay. Elon Musk doesn't give that for free. <laughs> So uh, we don't use his system, we've got uh, another system, satellite system, and it works. I don't know what we pay, my wife pays the bills, but it's like, I don't know, 50 bucks a month or something like that, Canadian. So okay. it's worth it. So, it so the bills would be some food, gas, internet, anything else? Tools, tools and equipment. You know, look at that, roof patch, vapor barrier, you know, epoxy resin. Rolled roofing right behind you here. So, yeah, I mean, those are $114 each Canadian right there. Seven of them, so, yeah, to build a cabin in the bush, sure, you can you can mill, like we milled all our lumber for the rafters and the walls, and that takes you, you know, months and months and months, back-breaking work. So, every now and then, it's nice to buy something that's ready to go. All you gotta do is nail it down. Tell us about, uh, you got some solar panels here? Oh, one tiny little one. And I have two batteries in here. These two are deep cycle batteries connected in parallel. So negative to negative and positive to positive. So it gives me a, a deeper bank to store the power. And then I have a little inverter here. Turn her on. And I turn on that little puppy there and then there's my internet. And I should have lights. <laughs> Do we have lights? Yeah, we have lights. A uh, little LED light takes, I don't know, six watts or something, so not much. A modem and then router right here. So we get about 100 feet, 125 feet coverage. So we can be out at the cook shack and have internet. And then here's our uh, <laughs> little office. Got our laptops plugged in and all our devices. <laughs> my castle. So this is my little COVID project here. My son and I stayed at home for two and a half years and did our due diligence and uh, so every Saturday night we had castle night so this is what I built from basically scrap wood and lumber and little bits of metal and wood and leather and so my son and I would have battles every every Saturday night between his castle and my castle and we just roll die or dice to figure out the the action uh, five or six was a killing shot and if you're in defense then uh, uh, three, four, or a five was a killing shot. And uh, yeah, we battled with our animals and our soldiers and our beasts and our mythical beings. And I paid a total of about 75 cents for everything here, just for the, uh, the gardens here. Had to get some actual felt. Everything else is scrap. Beer caps and old bits of leg furniture and, you know, furniture legs and lots of fun stuff. Sounds like a fun way to pass time during COVID. It was. It was very bonding for father and son. That's pretty much it. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. 12-volt um, battery. Um, and these are just general ones you can buy at Canadian Tire or any automotive store. You don't necessarily have to go to a solar supplier. I've had very good luck with deep cycle batteries. These are marine deep cycle. You can get them at a, a marine store or an automotive store. And just get a deep cycle with lots of amperage. That's pretty simple. Don't let them freeze. Keep them charged up. That's the main thing. And then, yeah, don't let your 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 batteries get too low. And if they do, you got to turn them off. And guess what? You're you've got candlelight. You know, until the next day and charge.
charge up your batteries again. So again, it's about discipline, using the power when you need it. So in December here, when we only have a few hours of daylight, you know, we don't get much solar gain. So then you have to limit your time with lights or online or whatever. Or you got to run a generator, which is not a first choice. Mm. Do you have a generator I here? I do. I have a small generator, so it might run that for an hour in a day. And then you can use a blender or some other tool, so you line up all the things you need to do when the power's on, charge everything up, all your batteries, all your headlamps, all your portable devices. You know, got my DeWalt drill here that I power up here, you know. So, just got to line everything up and then charge them up at the same time. You got to maximize your efficiency. It's all about maximizing efficiency. So and this is your entire power supply. And this is the entire power supply. Yeah, that's all it, all it is. And then I can also just put 12 volt lights on. And that way I don't need to use the inverter. I can just connect them directly, wire to wire, straight to the battery. Like the old tail lights and reverse lights out of trucks. I just use those and put them in a simple fixture and off you go. Normally this goes much more smoothly and he was going to cut it into rafters. However, this was not to be K-N-O-T. Too many knots in this log and it's just taken way too long. He's been here all day. He hasn't even gotten halfway through the first cut. So he's going to hang it up and that's going to be the end of, the, end of it for this day, right? Four tanks of gas. Six hours of cutting. <laughs> And, and how many hours of sharpening? Oh, yeah, that's included, but yeah, insane. Inc so, yeah. Things don't always go we'll how go you like them. Plan B. Plan B. It will be. And this is my flooring system, which I think is the best thing ever. It's the best thing on earth because you don't need to pay for it. You don't need to wash it. You don't need to clean it. You don't need to polish it. You don't need to repair it. You need to do nothing. You can come in here with your bare feet and walk on it and it gives you your own private reflexology session. You can come in here with your big winter boots on with snow on them. You can walk on the floor, the snow falls off and it melts in a couple of minutes and it's gone. You can walk on here in stocking feet or socked feet and your feet don't get stuff because these are lake shore pebbles. They're rounded, they're washed by the glacier and streams and the lake. So they're nice and round and there's no sharp edges. Uh, to me, it makes total sense. Um, things don't rot on it because, because it allows air to breathe. So you don't have, that's just fluff, that's not mold. But things don't mold because I've got, I don't know, probably four inches of this here. Um, all I do if I want to have a spring cleaning is I go down to the lake shore, which is just down the hill, and just go down there with my truck and get four or six more buckets of uh, fresh rock in the spring. I bring it in and I throw it down and I rake it out flat and it looks like I have a brand new floor because it's got that polished look to it because it's fresh from outside, whereas this stuff gets a little bit dull after you've been walking on it for a couple of years. This is the perfect low maintenance floor. Zero, not low. Zero maintenance. No vacuuming, no sweeping, no nothing. Nothing. Beautiful. Beautiful. And sustainable, ecological, and free. Also get the grounding. And it's so important that we as humans walk barefoot on our earth because then we get the magnetic grounding between us and the earth. And we were designed to be that way. We, the Creator made us such that we can walk around in our bare feet. So yeah, if you need to have shoes on for a while, wear your shoes for a while you need to have them on. But any opportunity, take them off and walk barefoot on the earth. Because you ground out with the earth. All your negative energy will be carried away. Your stress and your trauma and your grief and all that yucky stuff goes back into the earth and is taken away. And the positive stuff comes back up into you. The re-energize. Like, like, why do people love going camping? They lie flat on the earth and they recharge their batteries. When you lie with your back on the earth, nobody can go to a city park and lie back on the earth and think, oh, this is awful. I don't feel good. You go, wow, this is great. I'm lying here on the earth and I'm re-energizing. The second thing I want to say that we, I forgot to mention about having an earthen floor 
um, or a gravel floor is that there's no insulation between this cabin and the earth. So yeah, this floor is colder in the winter time than a standard wooden floor because you have this much insulation, right? And you're keeping the heat in. But there is an inverse relationship that happens. So I'm still getting heat from the earth. I'm getting more heat than a standard house with this much insulation because you're negating the heat of the earth. You're not allowing the heat of the earth to come in because the heat of the earth is plus four degrees Celsius. So it's just above freezing. So um, the, the earth is actually giving me four degrees of heat. It's not warm. It's cool if you're walking around in bare feet, but you're getting that benefit. So here's where it comes into play. You leave your cabin for two days and you're gone. You come back to this cabin and you walk in, it might be minus 20 degrees Celsius outside, but you walk in here and it's like minus four degrees Celsius. So it's still cold, it's still frozen, but it's only minus four. And you walk in and it's like, did somebody light a fire? You come up to the fire and it's cold. You're getting plus four coming up from the earth naturally for free. There's the benefit. Tell us about bathing. How do you take care of that out here? Sauna, or as known in Europe as a sauna. Uh, so, key to living in the bush. If like you don't have hot and run, cold running water, is having a sauna. Um, Europeans have known that, especially the Northern Europeans for many centuries. Um, get it nice and stoking hot, and then you sweat. So you're actually cleansing yourself from the inside out. You're sweating out all the impurities and toxins. Your skin is actually your biggest eliminatory organ in your body, bigger than your digestive system. So if you're sweating toxins out, it's the fastest, easiest way to get yourself healthy and clean. And then after you do the sauna, then do you run Give down? Pool. In the winter time, you can roll in the snow, but in the summer, if you have a pool or a tub of water, that's the best thing to do. Because then you get the hot coal effect, which is good for your circulatory system and your heart and all that good stuff. Yeah, because you yeah. do have a warm spring on the property, right? We do have a warm spring. We're, we're blessed with our own little warm springs. But if you don't have one, a mountain creek will do. Or a little lake or a pond. Or even a, <laughs> a drum with a bunch of water in it. Many ways to do it. All right, so cutting some wood to get the sauna started. Exactly. That's the name of the game. So how often do you use the sauna then? Minimum once a week. It's a once a week thing. Back so, in the old days in North America, there was always the Sunday bath. Um, because back, I'm talking old days, 1920s and stuff. What's that before running water and everything? Um, you only had to bucket all your water in from wherever from the well or from the cistern or from the creek. So people had to share baths back in those days. But this one's a naughty old balsam fir. So we are behind fir. All right, so we're gonna have a our weekly bath. Yes. So we're gonna get some water from here. This is the uh, warm springs, but any mountain creek or creek in the bush will do. Uh, the idea is to bring in water into your sauna and then heat it up on top of your stove so that you have warm water which you can use to shower. And by shower, I don't mean shower like shower head, just bucking it over your head with a decanter of some sort. I have a little brass one on a wooden handle which I prefer. Some people just use a yogurt container or a plastic ice cream tub. The main thing is bring your water in a couple hours before your sauna. Heat it up until it gets toasty hot. So what we got here is your standard 45 gallon drum. And it's got a kit called the SOTS, S-O-T-Z, which you can get in the U.S. Probably can get it here in Canada too. Um, and you just cut it out, cut a square out, and then uh, put this little door on. And then you've got yourself a, a cheap wood stove or a wood heater. And the good thing about them is you can get a 33 inch piece in there, a long piece, you know, that long, so less cutting. And then you can stoke them up and they can last eight hours. So you 
me a nice long burn. And it burns like a locomotive. Listen to it. And we only lit this fire like four and a half minutes ago. And she's already pumping out the BTUs, the British thermal units, the heat. And we've got the water on top to yeah, create so the steam for the sauna. Yeah, and then I have a system here in this sauna. So this one here is for your herb water. So people like in these parts, we use balsam uh, fir boughs or cedar, if you can get cedar. So this is for the medicine water, which gives an aroma to the sauna and aids in upper respiratory cleansing and healing if you have colds or things like that, sore throats. So this is the medicine pot. And these two here are hot water pots. So uh, I make sure that those ones are full. And then uh, you use those for your bathing pot. So you don't want to use a plastic tub. I have a brass one on a wooden stick. And then I'll just take it out of there when it's hot, not too hot, not too cold, and pour it over my head. And that's my shower. It's that simple. This sauna was here when I got here 32 years ago. So the sauna is over 45 years old. Um, I've only replaced the roof maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Some friends of mine came here and we did that on a weekend. The sod does two things. Number one, it's actually relatively waterproof because if you ever watch dry earth uh, or parched earth, when the rain comes, it runs off, right? Because it's too dry, it won't soak in. So same thing with a sod roof. It, if it's too dry, it'll roll off, and then even if it's saturated, it reaches a saturation point, and then the moisture rolls off. So either way, it's relatively impervious to water. The only problem is you'll have moisture inherent in the lower reaches of the soil. So you do have to put a membrane on that's somewhat resilient, like cedar or something like that. Here we put on some rubber membrane, just a thin rubber membrane, so that the, the roof itself wouldn't rot. The second thing that's good about a sod roof, apart from it being free and locally available, is the fact that you do get some uh, R value out of it. It's very little. I think it's only an uh, R1 per 6 inches. I think it's quite low. So you don't get as much insulatory value as you do get thermal mass, and which is different than insulation. Insulation stops the heat from leaving. Thermal mass holds the heat in because like metal, right, or a brick, a fire brick, holds the heat because it has mass and the heat is absorbed in the mass of the metal or the brick. Same thing with sod, it'll hold some heat in. Same thing with a log cabin, big thick logs, thicker the logs, the more thermal mass you have. So that's the principle at play here. So when this hot sauna heats up and you get that sod hot, which takes two to four hours, it throws heat back in. So when you're in the sauna, in the first two hours of going in there, the heat's coming from the stove. If you go in like I do, I'll go in six hours from now. I let all the other young people go in first when it's, when it's colder or hot, but not super hot. I like it stoking hot. So hot the sap is melting out of the woods, the knot of the woods. And then the heat is coming at you from all sides because it's getting reflected or radiated back at you from the roof and the sidewalks. That's how to have it really hot sauna. That's the way the Finns and the Russians do it. They heat it up all day and they go in at the end of the day. That's the trick. Welcome to my chicken coop. I was uh, the proud owner of nine beautiful hens until last week. We were downsizing here on the homestead and uh, we had them since day old. And they were a project for my son who was homeschooled. So he raised them right from day old. And we gave them away to a friend because we were downsizing here on the homestead. Uh, but they were wonderful birds that you could love and hold and stroke. And of course they produce beautiful eggs, beautiful organic eggs. And you have rabbits as well? I do have rabbits right out here. And the rabbits, their primary purpose, apart from getting lots of love, is manure. He knows he's on camera. <laughs> he knows he's on camera. <laughs> this is George and Fred uh, of Harry Potter fame. Yeah, so they are beautiful creatures who are very loving and pure and trusting. Um, 
and they're always grateful. I've raised all sorts of livestock from cattle to horses to pigs to goats to turkeys to ducks, you name it. And my favorite, of course, is rabbits because they are always appreciative of everything you feed them and everything you give them. They always like love, more so than food actually. They want love. You can bring them a plate of food and they want love before they eat their food. So we have them because they are second only to bat guano for the value of the manure. And most people don't realize that. that that's you know better than chicken, better than horse, better than sheep. Um, and of course it's dry. I mean, you can pick it up with your bare hands um, any time of the year, summer and winter, you can pick it up. It's dry and I mean, they're eating a good diet. I, we feed them mostly weeds from the garden. We feed them a bit of grain, barley and oats and stuff, but it's mostly green stuff. So whatever I'm feeding them from the garden, I feed them kale every day and I feed them lamb's quarters and chickweed and watercress and they even like peppermint and catnip. Catnip is one of their favorite things. Like who would have known? And you don't know till you try. And we had the school kids out here for a tour the other day and one kid says, can I feed them peppermint? And I went, I don't think they'll eat it. The boy fed it to the rabbits and they loved it. So I didn't even know that. And I've been raising rabbits for 15 years. And you know the added benefit? The rabbits had minty fresh breath. They did, minty fresh breath. So that's why we have the rabbits is for the manure, for the garden, otherwise the garden doesn't grow, especially in the north. You need manure. It's critical in the north, north of 60 degrees north latitude. You have to have animals if you really want to get a, an effective um, compost. The manure can be put on fresh or raw onto the garden or you can compost it and it really helps to um, activate your compost with enzymes and bacteria and make a nice hot compost which is really important to eradicate weed seeds and to get a full compost. So that's why we have rabbits and we'll have up to 30 in the peak of the summer when, when, when they're breeding and right now we just have our five main breeding stock left and we keep them over winter and then breed again in the spring. This is how rabbits say I love you. Are they for meat? The answer is no. They're for their poo. But yes, we do eat them because that's a byproduct, but it's secondary. So if we have 30 bunnies in the summer, they produce in poo all summer, and then in the fall we have to kill them and eat them. So what I do is I do what I'm doing now. I walk up to the bunny and I love it up. And I tell it that I love it and I appreciate it. And that I pray for it. I pray for its soul and its spirit. And then I take out my 22 and I kill it. And then I eat it and it, provides life for me and my family. And I'm sad to kill it. It hurts me to kill it. But that's life in the bush. If you want to live, you either have to kill a carrot or you have to kill a rabbit. And so I grow a garden, I eat carrots, you're killing the carrot. If you eat the root, you're killing the carrot. And I'm killing the rabbit, which is an animal, which is a sentient being put on earth by God to live in existence. And so I love the animals up and then do what I do to carry on. Tell me about home heating. Cast iron wood stoves or wood heaters is the best way to go, in my opinion. Um, wood is accessible almost everywhere on our planet. Um, you can harvest it yourself and you can store it easily. Cast iron uh, heats up slowly, but once it's hot, it throws its heat really, really well because it conducts heat and radiates it out. This one's a blaze tube yeah. made in Canada. This is actually an expensive stove. You're looking at $3,000 Canadian for this. Um, it's a high efficiency stove. Low output in my opinion, even though people say it's a high output, I call it a low output because it burns slowly and efficiently but doesn't put out as much heat as some of the older models built in the 70s and 80s which put out a lot of heat, but they also burn up wood four times as fast as this one. This one's super efficient. So it's got a small firebox. You can only get little 16 inch pieces in there. 
And we only cut them 12 inches long because we don't like to have to fuss uh, with fitting them in there. But you just stoke her up like that and put your newspaper in and make a bundle and stack it up crisscross and pretty soon you got a nice, nice fire going. Now do you have any backup sources of heat? Or do you just... Yeah, two more wood stoves. <laughs> So backup woods, I, I always believe in every building you should have two wood stoves or one heater and one stove. Like a stove, I'll show you a stove right here. Right now it's out of service because we've got the, the burner plates elsewhere. But this is a classic wood stove from 1952. It was actually designed as a coal burning stove. So you can burn coal or wood in here or a combination thereof. This is my baby. I bought it for 125 years. $125 Canadian 32 years ago and it's got me through 32 winters. It throws heat but it burns wood like a demon because it's not airtight. But you, you've got your pot on for your dishes, you got a pot for rinse water, you got a pot for coffee, you got a pot for tea and you got a frying pan on there cooking dinner and you got tons of room. So to me, I mean I've got three of these cook stoves on this homestead. One in each, one in our cook shack, one in our main cabin, and one in this cabin. And it's the way to go. I couldn't live without a cook stove. It's the number one thing. It's the number one thing ne next to my own heart. You have your heart that keeps your body warm. You have your cook stove that keeps you warm. So between the two of these, even though that's five times more efficient than this one, if I had to make a choice, I'd rather cut more firewood and use this one. Because here you have all your water for bathing because you bathe in your cabin in the winter time unless you're lucky enough to have a sauna or a shower house you know you've got your oven we can bake anything in this oven bread you know pastries all kinds of stuff like my wife loves to bake and she's an excellent baker and then there's your ash drawer where the ash comes out you gotta empty that out once a week and then you keep your ash because your ash is good because you may need it for traction for your truck or your vehicle if you get stuck you can also throw it on your garden to melt the snow in the winter time or in the springtime so that you can garden a week or two earlier. And then also you can throw it on your compost heap or your garden if you need to lower your pH and make it more alkaline. So lots of uses. Several hundred yards down from Stephen's place is Dave's place. So this is the addition that I'm building on here. It's uh, 16 by 32 feet inside and with the overhangs and it's a bigger than that. This will give a lot more space. We've all the rafters I've hand milled with with the uh, chainsaw and yeah it's coming. We're looking forward to putting the plywood on the roof here this week. Tell me about these rafters. Oh yeah when you make you know mill your own rafters with a chainsaw sometimes you don't have as many 12 inches you want, so you have to come, uh, be creative and make some ten and a halfs and add another inch and a half on top of that to get a 12 inch. So that's what this is. Then I'll put some reinforcement in that too and it'll be solid. Put some plywood up against it. Today we got to put up the remaining rafters, and we're doing this for the extension that's being built here. Putting on the rafters to the new addition. Neighbors help neighbors here. That's how you get along in the bush. Okay, so David, pull? you can let it go now, and I'll okay. catch it, then I'll walk up. Actually, okay, you ladder. guys could just pull yeah. it like two feet more. Yeah, pull it two feet then more. Then it'll be balanced the other way. And then give me slack so it comes okay. down to me okay. now. Yeah. Easy. Easy. Down to me, yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay, okay. coming forward to my ladder. Okay, okay resting on my ladder. Good. Going up. Okay, here we come. Inch by inch. Okay, now you guys can give it a little, a little pull. Yeah, in she comes. Sorry. Up. In. Ooh. Just a minute. I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna come up one more. Okay. Good. Got it? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. This is the cook shack. The stream of the warm springs is your dishwasher here. Lunchtime might mean something good like soup and maybe even cinnamon rolls being made. Today we have a lunch of salmon and potatoes. Harvesting the midday feeding for the bunnies. So the good thing about bunnies is they eat pretty much anything green. So here we have Cooch grass or twitch grass or quack grass, which is relatively high in protein, and they love it. They eat all kinds of grass, weeds, broadleaf, dandelions. That's their favorite. Very healthy or healthful. So the good thing about rabbits is that they can turn things that are otherwise weeds or long grass that you want to get away from, get away with for fire safety. It can become a hazard having all this long grass around. You can get rid of and feed to your rabbits. He's a little bit camera shy. Right Zen? Alright you go boy. Gotcha my boy. There you go sweetie. He's uh, marking his territory. Something new has come in. This bucket is new. And so he's marking his scent glands on it. He says, okay, if it's on my territory, it's going to be mine. So that's why he's more interested in that than uh, the grass. But if I remove this, eat your grass then. Eat your grass. Okay, Dad, I'll eat my grass. You got me old grass. I wanted fresh young grass. This stuff is from June and July. There's wild rabbits here too, like this snowshoe hare. Keeps checking me out. Down the way from the other structures is Dave's cabin. This was one of the original structures on the property and it was a chicken coop and then it got converted into a horse barn and then Dave set about fixing this place up into making it his house. Tell us a bit about that Dave. Well, I, I came down and visited Stephen and Alyssa many times. We were good friends. And uh, I built an outhouse. I built uh, the main structure for a greenhouse. Uh, I like building. It's a hobby for me. And so after doing that, they said, you know, we'd like to have this building down here, the storage last years of storing canoes and stuff, turned into a residence for woofers. Uh, woofer being a worldwide organization of organic farmers. Uh, so people would come up here and help Stephen and they'd have a place to stay and some food and uh, gave help on the homestead. So I said, sure. Uh, so I, uh, all that was there was logs, like you see here, uh, and uh, an opening for a window with chicken wire on it. And um, so then I set about uh, framing it and uh, on the outside and cutting bigger openings and putting all the windows in here and a stove and set it up for somebody to live here and then afterwards after I'd set it up they said it's kind of an afterthought well why don't you come down here why don't you live here and I thought well that's a good idea I like it down here so I uh, I did a few more things for myself and um, came down and lived down here. 
and you've been living here for uh, 15, 17 years, somewhere about. What's this trail? Oh, uh, this is Trotsky Trail. If you got the trots, this is the trail you take. The view there, it's Mount Minto in the background, or the Tlingit name is Kion. And that mountain, you can see it's actually covered right now with a cloud cover. And that cloud cover has always been an indicator to the First Nation people of weather. And that means rain and stormy weather when the, when the mountain has a cloud over it. And the name Kion is the name for hemlock because there are hemlock trees growing there and there aren't hemlock anywhere else except getting to the coast. It's a coastal tree. So quite unusual to have a hemlock growing there and that leaves one speculating about the history of the mountain. This is the outhouse and I call it Pooh with a view. And that's where you would be seated looking out at your view. Elephant seal, the challenge. And this is Eli that made those. I helped him with the base, but that's Eli's work there. This is a photograph of Dave and Eli working together on a sculpture. This is a sculpture that Eli created, and tell us about that, Eli. Me and um, Dale worked on it, and um, we've called, called these um, elephant seals out of a rock, and we um, use them so going to um, grow these rocks and this um, stuff on, but except we didn't grow this stuff on, but we made it to look like waves, I think, and um, here it says challenging old bone here. It's it, um, there's Eli Bad for un Uncle David, April to 2021, and um, and I think the young guy is challenging the old guy. Elven seals are the largest seals in the w world, I think. And you car and carved this yourself? Me and David. Okay. And and what is the stone? What kind of stone? Soapstone, I think. Soapstone. That's a really great carving. The trunk. That's why they're called elephant seals, because they, they have kind of a trunk, and it can actually get quite long. This is Eli's latest sculpture. Tell us about that one. This guy is um, gold pen, and, um, and this is his hat, and we'll have a guy with a pickaxe here picking up the wall, and we got a waterfall here, and um, you got to keep taking more and more out of the walk out, and they'll get small and small until we're finished it. He's going to be facing this way and he'll be panning right in by the water pool here and the, this guy was as Eli said he's got a pickaxe and he's picking at the wall. Dave here is a soul man. He cooked <laughs> us some, uh -huh. some soul fish for dinner tonight. <laughs> How do you do laundry? Well Dirty old socks, galvanized wash tub, washboard, soap. All you gotta do is find yourself a little creek. Preferably a nice warm one like this one. Throw your socks or underwear in there. Get your soap going, rub them together. The idea with a washboard is it provides a little bit of friction. Cleans it up. And you just rub her up and down. Get the lather going good and hard. And you can work away for a few minutes on that. And this is how you do all your clothes, right? No. <laughs> it's how I do some of them. <laughs> and what do you I used do? to used to do a lot of clothes. What do you do with the other clothes? I take them to the laundromat. <laughs> like most other people, <laughs> cheaper and easier and faster. <laughs> But this is handy if you're not going to town for a couple of weeks and you can still do your laundry. Anyways, I squeeze out a little bit of the water and then over to the ringer. Don't drop your socks. You just gotta tighten your ringer down a bit and then put your socks through. Don't get your fingers caught in your ringer. 
it hurts. And then you tighten it again for the second pass. You get more water coming out. Tighten it a third time. Put them through. There you go. Socks are ready to hang up on the line and dry. In the wind, in the sun. My wife Alyssa is an amazing bushwoman. She tends to all the gardens and two greenhouses. She can split wood. She spits all the wood around here. She can bake anything right from scratch yeah, in our wood cook stove. All our meals are homemade right from first principles from the gardens and the greenhouses. She harvests berries, cans, freezes, preserves, and uh, yeah, she can shoot a rifle straight and she can skin a goat and she homeschools our son in a canvas wall tent. Eli is homeschooling right now. He's got the headphones on and he's talking to one of his teachers. Oh, I can do that. Oh, yeah, from the film. Oh, yeah, I've been in the film. Yes, I will be um, learning history from, from the show after, after we um, do some home, homeschooling from you today at the um, Columbia. Yeah. What is this structure here, Stephen? The workshop, the most important part of every homestead or farm or ranch. You need your workshop to be able to fix stuff. It's an old building that I pulled off another site and brought them out here log by log. Numbered all the logs and then rebuilt it here. This is a photograph of a grizzly bear chomping on that moose antler. This is right beside my cabin and I took the pictures from my roof. And those are grizzly bears. Those are grizzlies, yeah. And they do come through the property on occasion. Oh, yeah. Once you've tasted the wilderness, you'll never more go back. Out here, man is not apart from nature. Man is a part of nature. Once one realizes this, that person also accepts the risk that humans can become part of the food chain. One also comes to realize that every day is a gift. Out here, life is rugged, raw, and real. But there are rewards to living like this that are not easily measured. Breathing pure air and drinking water straight from the fountains of the earth. For those who choose this lifestyle, there are benefits to the mind and soul. Nature weeds out the weak or half-hearted. But for those who commit, there are benefits that go far beyond saving money. What road will you choose in life? When Stephen came here 32 years ago, he idealized and quite possibly romanticized the idea of living in the bush. But it wasn't long before reality struck, and he adapted more out of necessity than out of desire. He went from being a vegetarian wielding a bow saw to a carnivore wielding a chainsaw. Bush living is hard, and many of you out there may romanticize the idea of living this way as well. But it's always a lot of work. There's always a chore to be done or a task to be completed. While it's not quite raw survival, you do have a house. It's not for everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video and got some insight into living in the wilderness up here in the Canadian bush, not far from the Yukon border. Don't forget to give me a like on the video, share, and subscribe. Until next time, this is Rock Hopper. I'll see ya.